Well, Charles, I've got some good news and I've got some bad news. Good news is you finally got the top job. Bad news is a lot of people think we should just shut down the company. This is Later That Same Life. I'm Larry Fedorik, and on this weekly podcast, topics, discussions, stories from our lives. Season 8, Chapter 12, King Charles. The Coronation of Charles. This podcast will borrow heavily from my podcast episodes about Queen Elizabeth during her jubilee, and about the monarchy as a whole, posted shortly after her passing. I believe there are facts and opinions worth repeating. After all this time, we're finally making it official. The Coronation of Charles. A bloated, needlessly expensive, out-of-touch ceremony designed to ascend a human being to a throne that rules over an imaginary kingdom. This may also be the premise of a recent Disney movie. I almost feel sorry for Charles. He has waited his entire life for this. And then when he finally gets it, nobody wants him around. And he finds out that a lot of people don't even like him. Let's go back about 30 years. I picked 30 years because 30 years ago, Queen Elizabeth would be uh, 66. 66 is the retirement age in England. And not that the Queen or the Royals are subject to such things, but I'm thinking it's got to be rattling around in Charles's empty head. Mummy is retirement age. Perhaps she is contemplating stepping down soon. Little did he know that Mummy was going for the record. 30 years ago, life was good for Charles. It's good to be the king in waiting any day now. He's in his young 40s, beautiful wife, beautiful kids, mistress, living in a castle. He's got a weekend castle in the country, riding around in limousines. Any day now, I'll be king. Then, as if in the blink of an eye, 30 years go by. You're still not king. Your wife has died, tragically. You married your mistress. You're estranged from one of your beautiful kids. You're a crotchety old man with enormous hairs growing out of your enormous ears. You're a prince and a duke and a baron and master of your domain, but not king. Mumsy still wields the scepter. Not only that, but Mumsy shows no signs of slowing down. Alas, though, suddenly she did, as can happen when you're 96. Once things start to go downhill, they can go quickly. Who died and made you king? Well, Queen Elizabeth II, September 8th, 2022. Bonnie Prince Charles would be king. Charles. King Charles III, but of course not official until the most official coronation. That is a long time to be first in line waiting for the doors to open. And when they finally do, no one seems that glad to see you. Yeah, I almost feel sorry for him, but mostly not. The passing of the Queen did not begin the discussion on the monarchy's relevance in modern day society. That has been going on for a long time, but her death certainly brought it to the fore. We loved the queen, the person, more than we did the idea of a ruling monarchy. If we loved the queen less, it may have been a bigger discussion sooner. If we liked Charles more, if he was a different person, we may not be having this discussion now. But here we are. This is certainly an issue here in a constitutional monarchy like Canada. But the rest of the world is also looking at this concept of a royal family, a family with some national government uh, influence, however ritualistic it might be. CNN just did a big special on this, asking many of the same questions that I have. 
On a side note, you may have seen the promos. CNN will soon be airing a nightly primetime show called King Charles. Monarchists need not get too excited. It's actually a chat show hosted by Gail King and Charles Barkley. True, they're calling it King Charles. Oh, how super clever. Why would Gail King and Charles Barkley have a show together? I don't know. Poppy Harlow worked with Don Lemon. They didn't call the show Lemon Poppy. My favorite muffin, by the way. Of course, that's all moot now because CNN fired Lemon for being a misogynistic bully diva for the last 17 years. Hey, uh, I know DC reporter Lauren Fox and Wolf Blitzer, The Wolf Fox Show, Sanjay Gupta and Jake Tapper, The Sanjay Gupta Tapper Hour. I see a trend building. Well, not likely, but you know, King Charles, that's going to be a real show. I wish them every success. But back to the real deal. Chuck, the King of Canucks. Surveys over the years have consistently shown that the amount of Canadians in favor of the Royals has been declining steadily. But here's another one from only a few weeks ago, from Angus Reid. 60% of Canadians categorically oppose recognizing Charles as our sovereign. Oppose! It's a strong word. It means, I'm again it. Further, only 28% have a favorable view of Charles. And almost half, 48%, absolutely do not like him. And nothing personal, Camilla. But not a lot of people exactly enamored with you either. They're not comfortable calling you queen. And at least among Canadians, if they made William and Kate the king and queen... Support for the Royals actually drops down even a few more points. So, uh, Charles, take some comfort there. You know, it's not just you. It's uh, you and uh, anyone like you. I'm not surprised by the Canadian numbers. Canada has about 8 million francophones. I don't have survey numbers on them, and I don't pretend to speak for them, but uh, generally they are less likely to be loyal to a British monarchy. About 9 million other people in Canada have a first language that is neither English nor French. Add those numbers up, I'm saying that almost half of all Canadians, statistically, have no ties to the monarchy, no loyalty to the royalty. We've changed. They haven't. And of the half of the country that statistically might have some ties to the royals, how many are in favor of keeping them on, even if symbolically? I'm guessing less than half of them. I think the Canadian sales of Union Jacks and tea cozies are probably way down. Let's talk about that, the aristocratic presence in our country. It is largely symbolic. A lot of things are named after Queen Elizabeth. We swear oaths to the Queen, now King. She is still on the money, although it's really just one bill and a bunch of coins. But with debit cards and pay apps, who even sees money anymore? Oh, and we have a federal governor general and provincial lieutenants general. These are cushy do-nothing jobs that uh, historically have been handed out as political favors and whose salaries could uh, easily be issued to real people with real jobs. To their credit, though, the GGs and the LGs, they do some pretty fine ribbon cutting. You know, it's good to have a skill to fall back on. What I'm saying is if the monarchy suddenly vanished from Canadian life, it's not like we'd notice a big difference. And on a positive note, Fewer Canadian bears would have to die to provide pelts for the Royal Guardsmen's huge hats. The king is dead. Long live the bears. Most famously, Barbados recently cut ties and became a republic. Australia made some noise about it, but so far they haven't followed up. Canada? Well, those surveys show the monarchy's popularity is waning. It's tough to think that someone would want to go into history as being the prime minister that cut ties with tradition. 
it's possible. I guess it could become an election issue, but there are so many other issues ahead of it. Jobs, the economy, inflation, immigration, and so forth. It's tough to believe that there are enough Canadians, even though a polled majority says it's time, that would actually mobilize and take to the streets to demand some royal change. Once again, it's important to make this distinction between our government status, constitutional monarchy, king, technically our head of state, and our membership in the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth, formerly known as the British Commonwealth. It's a voluntary membership in a group of countries formerly members of the British Empire. For example, Barbados became a republic, but continued membership in the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth, once a force of imperial rule, is these days part trade organization, part social club, part historical society. Membership in the Commonwealth has considerably less value than membership in a G7, a G20, or any number of strict trade agreements. And if it is all just symbolic, why bother? Why bother one way or the other? Why bother, indeed? Well, we live in times where, increasingly, we're tearing down those symbols, those things that are symbolic, symbolic of mistakes we have made in our past, things that remind us that that was then, but this is now. Statues, portraits, naming rights, people and organizations. The more we find out the role they had in our human history, the more we say, I don't want that around every day as a reminder. We're tearing down the old symbols. I've said this before, I have no problem with Charles being King of England. England, where this bizarre concept of bloodline privilege began. Hey England, it's your tradition, not ours. Plus, it's become their Disneyland. Go to England, see the palace and the changing of the guards. If you're lucky, some pale pimply prince might pass in an antique carriage. Ride those teacups. Buy the t-shirt and souvenir mug. By the way, if you're not listening, watching this podcast on my YouTube channel, you will miss the picture of the King Charles mug that someone came up with. It is both cruel and hilarious. If the royal family is a valued industry in your country, England, then keep it. Otherwise, what's the use? Great Britain. They refuse to play nice with their European allies. They have a monarchist national anthem, a system of princes and castles, some of the highest taxes anywhere, well, it's no wonder they're struggling. They're stuck in the Middle Ages. Kingdom not united, Britain not that great. And they drive on the wrong side of the road. Monarchies are a racist concept. They go well beyond just being born in a privilege or a nepotism. Being born royal implicitly says you are better than the next person simply because of being born. That is racism. It's why Harry and Meghan got out. Now, I'm not a big fan of their strategies lately, but they're out. In the long run, probably better for it. Although, according to the royal rule book, Harry is still in line for the throne. He's fifth, up one spot from last year's chart. This royal lineage thing never ceases to amaze me. After Charles, the eminence will fall to his eldest, William. Then it goes to William's kids in order of age, George, Charlotte, Louis. Then it's Harry, and then it's Harry's kids. Four centuries, daughters were not in line for the throne, unless there was no other choice. Elizabeth became queen 
because George VI had no boys. Even if there was a younger brother, he would have been in line in front of Elizabeth. Well, that finally changed, and you know when? 2018. That's how recently the royal family decided to recognize that women were people too. Even though at the time a woman had been their sovereign for almost seven decades. Congratulations, Charlotte. You are third in line. You'll still never be queen, barring any unforeseen circumstances, and Harry will never be king. Because according to that Highness Handbook, as soon as little Georgie grows up and has kids, they skip ahead of siblings, uncles and aunts, etc. And then their children's children will also go to the top of the list. So Harry, you know, you could live to be a thousand, but your royal number is just going to keep spiraling until you're just like Zanuska Mowat. Who's Zanuska Mowat? Exactly. Well, she's a 30-something London socialite who's number 62 in line to the throne. Unlike Charles, she has not spent her entire life waking up every morning thinking, mm, maybe today's the day. I'll be coronated today. Harry at number 5 might as well be number 62. But like I said, probably better off with it all. You know, in L.A., maybe there they can at least give you a star on the Walk of Fame. Hey, you know, Harry stirs it up even when he's not trying. He's suing a Rupert Murdoch group of newspapers over illegal information gathering. Harry, some of the other royals, and actually a handful of famous Brits, have long contended that phones were hacked and personal information was compromised by uh, these, uh, and I use the word uh, loosely, members of the press. What came out recently in Harry's lawsuit was that the Murdoch group settled with Prince William a few years ago to the tune of about one million pounds. We didn't hear about that one, did we? Allegedly, one million pounds, a princely sum, as they say, went into a William bank account somewhere in the world. You know, normally rich people sue just to clear their name or right the wrongs. You know, they sue for a dollar in punitive damages. Or if they sue for more, they give the money to charity. But through Harry, it's implied that one million pounds went to William's favorite charity, William. Kensington Palace, which oversees the affairs of Wills, and Buckingham Palace, which oversees Chucky, both released similar statements. We do not comment on royal proceedings. Funny, I thought that was your job. The royal's financial worth has always been... Uh, bit murky. They do not own all of those palaces and the crown jewels. The government does, but they own a few. They are said to be worth several hundred million pounds. They receive 30 to 40 million pounds a year to maintain royal households. Hey, a good butler is expensive. They also have a tax-exempt status. Each working royal receives a healthy salary plus expenses. But I guess, you know, if you're William, it's nice to have a little of your own uh, mad money set aside. One million Murdoch pounds. Over the decades, the royals have also been accused of taking large sums of money from lobbyists in order to exert what influence they may have on economic projects. Not saying, just saying. And, of course, when it comes to Prince Andrew, he's also been accused of a few other things, too. No wonder Elizabeth, even near the end, would rather have tea with Paddington Bear than with Prince Andrew. So, happy coronation, Charles! Like I said, I almost feel sorry for you. You know, if I was a nicer person, I might. Royals? Racist? outdated, non-functioning, non-contributing, a throwback, mired in controversy, and a family squabbles. And is this what we look up to? What we hold dear and precious? A tradition worth keeping? Time to cut the cord on that. I remember a royal commentator, you know, because in England, that's a job you can have, royal commentator. A commentator who said, 
the royals will only exist as long as the people want them to. It's time. If we keep showing up on all the parades and ceremonies, they will continue to live under the pretense that we care. And live well, by the way. But it's crumbling. You know, it's falling apart. And the British royals are not a fixer-upper. They're a tear-down. Queen Elizabeth was the last little bit of glue that held this castle of cards together. And Charles, well, he's not glue, although he is a bit pasty. Later That Same Life is written, voiced, and produced by Larry Fedoric. LarryFedoric37 at gmail.com. Subscribe to Larry's podcast YouTube channel. Get automatic notifications with each new episode. 